The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. This is Mark Olson. Appreciate you dialing in today. We have folks from near and far, so I appreciate you taking the time to come in. Speaking of near or far, here we got uh, Bob. Bob is uh, actually over in, let me see if you pull up the map, Italy this week. We'll have Bob back here next week, uh, and then next month he'll be giving a presentation, Coffee with Coletti, dealing with glycol. So related to our topic here involving magnetic separation, excuse me, I had to turn my phone off, and, um, and water quality. It's a topic near and dear to my heart, magnetic separation. It's a straightforward technology solving a real problem in the marketplace, including commercial systems, which will be a topic for today. Uh, some housekeeping, certificate of participation, all of you will receive automatically from us. Don't worry about contacting. It will come out to you by email from uh, our marketing group. That will be automatic. And while we're here, a uh, lot of stuff today. We have action-packed um, uh, content, and uh, you might want to come back and take a look at it. So uh, this is being recorded, so you'll see it on our website within, well, Rex usually gets it up there, Mary, within a couple of days. And then lastly, uh, a PDF, if you're interested in a hard copy, just uh, give us a shout, send us an email in response to one of the emails we'll be out with you on, and uh, we'll be happy to give you a copy uh, if you want to have that for reference as well. So magnetic separation and hydronic systems. I'll be covering sources of dirt formation, and within those sources, a particular type called ferrous oxide. I'm sure you've heard of it. We're going to delve down into the details of this particular type of debris and some of the problems it uh, creates for us as designers and maintainers of hydronic systems. We'll get into well, how it forms, we'll talk about problems. We'll talk about the important role of air and system componentry in a hydronic system. We'll talk about this thing called magnetic separators. Now, I suppose the numbers you are um, familiar with magnetic separators already. Some probably not no matter. Those that are familiar, we're going to talk about some things perhaps you didn't know. And if I do this right, I'm going to pop up a poll here that you'll be very interested in. Let's see where to go. Uh, launch it. Okay. So I'm going to give a couple seconds here for you to take a look at this poll. And the question is, have you previously specified, sold, or installed a magnetic separator? So go ahead and uh, do that and see kind of where everyone lands here now. All right. So I'm going to give it one more second before closing it up, and I'll close her up right about now, all right, and I'll share the poll with all of you. Okay, well, kind of split, 60 no, 40 percent yes, so there is an understanding of magnetic separation out there uh, today. Okay, so uh, hopefully you can still see my screen. If my guys know what they can't see my screen, let me know, <laughs> otherwise I'll continue on. Uh, other dirt capture devices, role of chemicals, and then all along we're going to talk with using a lot of installation examples starting here. Ongoing sources of dirt formation in the hydronic system. Uh, we, we see really three categories, one being hard water. Hard water is laden with calcium and magnesium, um, uh, magnesium salts, if you will. Uh, when heated, they come out of solution, and they can present a problem such as this commercial condensing boiler had back in down in Chicago using basically just city water from Chicago, which isn't too hard. Maybe, I forget, six, ten grains, something like that. Okay. Uh, galvanic, and by the way, we did webinars on hard water in the past. If you want to look at that in more detail, go ahead and look at our archive. Galvanic attack. Here's a shot from Jeff Person, the geo sources, the plumbing situation. But whenever you have metals excuse me, that are largely different on the um, element scale of uh, nobility. As an example, this T here, this, this nipple is brass and this T is, um, is steel connected with one another. You, if you have water that has conductive capabilities, basically with elements in it, you can set up basically galvanic attack. 
in galvanic attack it seems to be more pronounced when you have other issues in your system, such as this last one, oxidation of metals, which is our focus for today, specifically within that ferrous oxide, or known as iron oxide in the marketplace. Now, of course, there's aluminum oxide, there's copper oxide, and other types of corrosion that takes place, but pri primarily, the key one, most prominent and most difficult one to address is ferrous oxide. So we'll talk about ferrous oxide. Here's a great uh, shot from Ken down in uh, Ken Shockley in Indiana. This is a failed, I believe, commercial boiler. This is a cast iron boiler. And if we look real closely, we can see some red here on this particle. We see, um, as our as forensic artists, we see white over here. And um, we also see basically a bunch of other different types of particles. So a lot of times foreign objects or um, dirt uh, exist in our system, not in a homogenous form, but in multiple forms. If we ran a magnet across this, by the way, we'd probably have a bunch of stuff jump up to that magnet indicating um, uh, iron oxide. So let's take a look at iron oxide in more detail. And um, from a chemical standpoint, and I'll get through this pretty quickly, how does, how does ferrous oxide even come to exist in our system? Well, water reacts with iron and oxygen, creates ferrous oxide and hydrogen. And the ferrous oxide up here continues to react and form water, hydrogen, and Fe3O4, otherwise known as magnetite. Okay? Magnetite is a common form of debris in our hydronic systems. It also exists naturally in the Earth's surface. There's some magnetite pebbles. A chemist might refer to that as ferrous ferric oxide to be technically precise, but we'll stick with magnetite. At a minimum, it's easier to remember. Now, probably back in school, your school days, you remember hearing about lodestone back in, um, in elementary school. Lodestone actually is a magnetite with a slight charge to it. It was what early compasses were made out of. And here's a magnet type lodestone stone with nails showing its uh, attraction. A little tidbit of information. If magnetite continues to react with um, oxygen, another product that could exist in a hydronic system and does is Fe2O3, more, I guess, technically referred to as ferric oxide or, or, or hematite. And then ferrous oxide, FeO, Ferrous oxide really is FeO, not so common in a hydronic system, but very common particle in uh, industrial pigments, paints, and things of that nature. Now, we're going to take advantage of one characteristic that all of these oxides that might exist in the hydronic system, and that is they have ferrous. They are attracted to a magnet or a magnetic field. And now you're getting a sneak preview on where we're going with this uh, solution, okay? So let's take a look at some photos here. Starting with hematite. Now, this uh, obviously isn't hematite. This might be something. This actually looks like the the bathtub uh, at my grandfather's farm in northern Michigan when I was a kid. Uh, come on, Mark. It's your it's your monthly bath time. <laughs> Believe you me, we'd let that water run a long time before hopping in, and we never had any iron deficiency problems either, by the way. Uh, but anyway, that's rusty water, and uh, very similar to the type of water that you might fill out of a hydronic system if you're going to purge it. Mr. Koch here had a system where had um, basically a radiant system where oxygen was permeating into the system through the um, radiant tubing. So there was a common ongoing source of oxygen into the system and perhaps coupled with not very good air separators led to what is hematite or a reddish color. If you purge a system and you find reddish color, it's often associated with also something else in the system, perhaps chunks of rust in the bottom of your boiler like we saw in that earlier example. Okay. Another form is magnetite, right? Fe304. Here's another hydronic system where it was purged, and it's now black. This is from New Hampshire. All right, black color, more prevalent. It indicates less oxygen in the system as you would when you see hematite in the system. And here's another shot of another system being purged and, um, and um, the magnetite. No, no matter, don't worry about it being sent to the ground. It's not polluting anything. These are natural materials, as you know, magnetite and, and water. But it's, uh, this one's a little bit more of a tarry look, and you can tell it's uh, stuff that's, uh, well, it can be kind of tricky. So to figure out what to do, do with this, 
designing a component to deal with it as well as how to do it, uh, how to address it in a system, it's very useful to take a look at magnetic properties. You can tell from the font on this, this is right out of uh, Wikipedia, but I'm going to jump down to uh, the hardened scale, 5.5 to 6.5. You're talking some pretty hard material, and by reference, you're all familiar with glass and how hard that is. That's uh, more or less in the same neighborhood. Uh, a penny, your common penny would be about three, so we're talking about some hard stuff. And specific gravity, uh, not as heavy as steel, as you see here, but obviously heavier than water by a long measure. And that property comes into play here in just a, a few slides in terms of what this can do in a hydronic system. It's useful to take a look at what this uh, views as in a microscope. And here you can see, it would be nice if it was just round all the time. You can see very jagged edges and kind of this crystalline form uh, associated with magnetite. And in terms of size, uh, at the smallest, you're talking 0.05 micron. That, by reference, is about 1 one-hundredth the diameter of the human hair. We can't see it, right? Microscopic. And its biggest sizes might be, well, a pinhead size. It's smaller than that. A pinhead that you stick into a needle cushion, probably half that size of the, of the bigger. So we're talking microscopic to small at best. And that presents some interesting issues for us. So um, let's think about how magnetite behaves in a system and just take a simple system. We have a, a heat source. It could be a chiller tube. We could have used a heat pump or something. And we have, a, say, a circulator, some type of distribution network just to keep things real elemental here. And so magnetite is basically the oxidation of water, or um, I'm sorry, iron from water in oxygen. And it could take place anywhere in the system. But let's say we have black pipe is our source of uh, uh, iron. And if we were to take a look at black pipe on the inside beginning to corrode, we'd see something like this. Magnetite starting to form. I know these are really small, as I mentioned. And by themselves, individual particles, they don't do anything. All right. The problem is they accumulate. Now, when they begin to form, nothing happens. They stay attached to the metal that started them. But when the circulator kicks in, fluid velocity washes them away only for them to start circulating through the system. Now, that irregular shape I mentioned, they kind of float around like a banaline seed, if you will. So either one, be caught in something that it shouldn't be in, okay, or two, to settle out somewhere. When the pump turns off, because the specific gravity is uh, heavier than water, they kind of settle down, right? And then they pick back up and get washed away again, only to find somewhere else in the system. Over time, they can begin caking up and create problems. And I'll show you a photograph in a, in a second. But what we'd rather do is don't let them have a chance of doing that. As they're floating around and floating around, let's, let's gravel. Now, we could put a centrifugal type device in there, like a, a motor-driven uh, device for like, separating cream from milk or... Um, I don't know, water from oil, for, it, for instance. But we would have to use electricity in doing that. It would be expensive. But we're going to take advantage of magnetic properties to do the same. If not, we can come up with something like this. Thank you, Mr. Graves from Heatmeister. This is a failed boiler uh, section. And it's a classic look of magnetite building up in the bottom of that boiler. Magnetite settled down, got washed away, settled down, eventually started caking up creating an insulation barrier where heat can no longer get conducted away from the flame or the gases, all right? So this piece of the metal, this piece of the cast iron becomes relatively very hot, over here relatively cold, and us, uh, us out there who have been around these know that what happens, crack. Thermal stress is set in, and now you have a leaking boiler that has to be replaced. Uh, thanks, Richard. By the way, I'm not quite sure what this is up here, this uh, gooey stuff. Perhaps this is a radiant system that has uh, some biological growth forming in it, or someone has a real good sense of humor and put some, put some caramel in that photograph. <laughs> it almost looks tasty if you didn't know otherwise. Other problems that create uh, in hydronic systems, because of the small grittiness of these uh, particles, wearing of O-rings. Here's a, a valve needing to be replaced on a system known to have magnetite problems, OK? Um, mechanical seals, lip seals type of devices that you would see in more of a split case or in suction or inline type of a pump 
as you see here, now you don't see any leaking here. This wasn't uh, leaking. We don't have a photo of that yet, but any of you guys out there would be uh, uh, gracious enough to send us one for future training. We would appreciate it, but uh, all of us have seen leaking mechanical seals resulting from the abrasion. Even if it's ceramic and ceramic type face seals, they will succumb to, in time, that grittiness of iron oxide. Now, the oxide by itself sometimes combines with other elements to create a sludge. Even in copper pipe that has relatively high velocities going through it can eventually get clogged up as we see in this copper pipe. And to continue on with our issues of problems, a commercial condensing boiler, fire tube type, here's a cutaway over here. Here's the same type of boiler that's coming to the effects of a concoction of iron oxide along with probably well, we can see the oxide by indication of red over here, but we also see kind of a white color here. It could be uh, uh, scale forming with that before that boiler needed to be replaced. Mr. Jim Paling from First Supply was gracious enough, gracious enough to be a guest host last week, last month, on water quality. Did a fine job. This is a nice photograph. You can see darker sludge, probably a higher mix of oxide causing a problem before that one failed. And Flat plate heat exchangers, here's a big one. They're very efficient in sending heat from one part of the system to another and separating the system at the same time. But they all have in common very narrow passageways between those plates, right, to give you high efficiency. They don't like oxide E either. Here's a failed section of, uh, we pulled apart a flat plate heat exchanger that failed a combination of oxide and some scale before this one had a problem. And we all know that uh, plate heat exchangers are part of our tools and as designers of hydronic system that this beautiful job on Colorado shows uh, submitted to us on the Calefia Excellence Program a few months back. A picture of a volute in a uh, permanent split capacitor type standard uh, pump. Now pumps or circulators more aptly referred to, by the way, thank you, Heat Boy, um, have, they, have, they, they, they um, require special attention, especially the high efficiency ECM, we call them smart pumps, become more and more common. These are all great pumps, right to the left, top to bottom. They don't consume much power as compared to a standard permanent split capacitor pump, and they're smart, allowing you to be very, mm, sophisticated in how you can have them perform in your system. They're residential size and now become more and more commercial. Um, I attended a webinar from a very um, big pump manufacturer a few days ago and um, I was heard, heard that up to 10 horsepower now, these commercial size smart pumps are now in place. All these ECM pumps, electronically commutated motor pumps, have something in common. They have permanent magnet rotors, all right, wet rotors. Here's a couple that got taken out. We hung some tools from them to give you an idea of how strong those permanent magnets are in those rotors. And, and that's exactly what those are. They're permanently magnetized, those rotors. They don't require a electric field to induce a motor to create the torque on the rotor. The magnets are already there permanently. And thus becomes kind of a challenge in some cases as it relates to water laden with magnetite. Here is our own kind of rendition of uh, this generically a permanent magnet type motor, wet rotor motor. Um, here's your windings over here, copper windings on either side. Here's your stack of laminates. Uh, green indicates the canister in which the rotor rotates in, okay? So basically, we pulled the impeller out of here, but the, the impeller would induce uh, some flow to go up past the bearing Pass the permanent magnet, keep things flushed out, cool, and lubricating the bearing all along. They're beautiful. But what we want to make sure we do as, uh, is we want to make sure that we keep them clean. And this permanent magnet right here, the closer that magnet can get to the stator over here, the more efficient this pump can be. So manufacturers, I'm going to assume, are trying to always keep that a very thin uh, distance, but at the same time, you have to have enough distance to allow water and anything else in that water to flush through, okay? And so thus becomes sometimes a challenge for certain design circulators. And as uh, here's an example of a permanent magnet rotor that we pulled out. Um, just to show you what happens is that uh, uh, the iron oxide can accumulate here. You can see that. 
and it could create a little bit of a drag on that rotor. You want that rotor to be really slippery. You don't want to create a drag on it. If you have enough magnetite in there, uh, you could actually get that motor to start stalling. And as this one did that we found in uh, one of our visits, this is uh, uh, another uh, pump that stalled. Uh, the technician went in, disassembled the pump, honestly, and cleaned her off very sparkly new again, put her back in, and off she went. And as we understand, it's been fine ever since. So, uh, but it's a good example of um, what um, magnetite can do to an ECM pump that, you know, cause them to work harder to do the uh, delta P or delta T type of uh, algorithm that they're programmed for. Now, before we leave this, you can see the telltale side of uh, so This is a pretty hard shaft right here, and you can see the scoring, you know, that grittiness of that oxide causing, uh, you know, some wear on there. So, sources of, uh, jumping to, okay, we just talked about some problems. Let's jump to, um, well, how does um, air even get into a system? Because that's one of the three ingredients for uh, creating iron oxide, right? So air, sources of air. Well, firstly, any hydronic system is going to have components that get old and begin to wear. And as they begin to wear, they begin to leak. And um, so if they end up needing to be replaced, that section of the hydronic system gets isolated off, repaired, Makeup water perhaps comes in. Makeup water has air in it, and so there's one source of uh, air that can get into a system. Um, sometimes the placement of a pump in relationship to the expansion tank could be the culprit. Sometimes an undersized expansion tank could cause air to come in through air vents or air separator um, sections. Um, the expansion tank by itself uh, needs to be uh, looked at. Well, one source of air is the diaphragm that's in that expansion tank. Perhaps air that's uh, on the cushion side of that diaphragm begins to, through osmosis, leak air up into the system only to end up becoming waterlogged. Now, that's a really slow process and not too big of an issue. A bigger issue is, and more common, is the installer connecting the expansion tank up to the system before pressurizing the system. The system should be pressurized independently of the expansion tank. So if we want 30 PSI on our system, say it's a three or four story building, we might want 30 PSI in a mechanical room if it's, not, if it's on the lower floor. We want to make sure that before we connect that expansion tank up, put that thing on 30 PSI. If we leave it at the 12 PSI or whatever it comes out of the factory from, hook it up, all right, it might quickly go to almost 30, maybe 28 PSI, and the contractor might take the Schrader valve and get it up to 30 and think he's good to go, but now you've compromised the system. You might end up in a pressure relief valve on the boiler spilling off some water, causing more in in incoming water on wake-up. You might end up in a very cold time of the year, the air vents in the very top of your building, actually, instead of being under pressure, actually having pressure at that part become less than atmosphere bringing air into your into your hydronic system. So there's lots of different ways air can get into the system. Tubing that doesn't have oxygen barrier, this is an example of just a nice shot from Abel of our manifold with all kinds of different um, tubing that um, just is a good example of showing there's a lot of tubing out there and especially during the, it seems like during the recession start, there was a lot more uh, non-oxygen barrier tubing going into radiant systems, well, it's cheaper, and um, and we see the same trend in boilers, you know, more, conden more non-condensing boilers going in, perhaps cast iron, and then as the economy is starting to pick up, more condensing boilers again going in when the money's more freed up. So a um, good shot of um, PEX. Um, this is a necessarily non-oxygen barrier, but it's a good shot of showing what uh, kind of a home run system here with this PEX. Mr. Schlicker is a good designer of systems here in Wisconsin. Okay, so we talked a little bit about how air can get into a system. I guess the savvy engineer knows that, or designer or installer knows that. In time, air gets into every system. The third ingredient is ferrous sources. You know, what's, what, what in the system can actually be ferrous? Well, <laughs> it doesn't take much imagination to at a glance know uh, how many sources of ferrous components could be in a system. Here's uh, one sent in from... Uh, on Kalefi Excellence, our program, I think it's work in process because I see an old boiler over here. But I see some new components, very high efficiency boilers, some great or, um, circulators, even a new Kalefi air and dirt separator up here. Uh, but you can see a lot of ferrous components over here. And here's that same job with, uh, looks like a new Buderis boiler going in. 
Um, but it's a good place to pause and say, as it relates to iron oxide or any form of debris, the designer and the installer needs to be aware of that when you have a retrofit system, it's a, it's a, the issue is heightened. Why? Because your system has already been a little bit compromised. Uh, at a, at a minimum, at minimum, your piping or your heat emitters could have already built up oxide. Here's a classic case of an incubation area for iron oxide. I guarantee you this has iron oxide sitting at the bottom of that uh, uh, very beautiful looking um, radiator. Okay. Now the, the installer could try to blow that out as good as he wants, but he's always going to have, because of the nooks and crannies, iron oxide in there, only waiting to somehow end up eventually being carried away to some other part of the system, at a minimum causing the efficiency of that radiator not to be very good, unless he wants to go to the expense of taking all these jack sections off and cleaning them out, which is going to be a, a horrendous job. <clears throat> Thank you, Mechanical Hub, for that photograph, by the way. So uh, not only the, those big cast iron radiators, but steel radiators have become more and more common here in North America. Here's a shot from uh, someone from um, uh, Calepi Excellence, a wall of um, low temperature, high surface area panel radiators, perhaps these are Biasi, I'm not quite sure, but um, as a form of radiant heat uh, without going into uh, a surface with, uh, with tubing. And I had to chuckle when I came across this. This is, uh, I called it Magnetite Man. It's almost like Magnetite trying to get out. That artist did a great job and it worked perfectly for this, <laughs> this webinar. Uh, I guess why we have our tongue and our cheeks. One of my favorite, all, mine and Mary's favorite all-time movies is Gladiator. And we were happy to hear that the sequel is coming out called Radiator. <laughs> That's too good. Anyway, so back to our topic at hand here. Other sources, expansion tanks. This gives you a good idea of expansion tanks, of course, being a source of, uh, if you didn't think otherwise, um, ferrous corrosion in a system. In fact, that these, this expansion tank failed. It was sent to us, and our Kevin uh, took a look at it, and uh, you can see what happened is uh, it corroded from the inside out, as always happens. A pinhole started and uh, pushed the paint away, and it leaked. And you can see the leakage down here, okay? Now, this is our own expansion tank, so we can pick on ourselves in this case. This was a solar job. We think maybe uh, maybe the solar collectors uh, got overheated too many times and that uh, glycol got acidic. Um, pH dropped, and now you have acidic water combined with oxygen uh, in a recipe for accelerated corrosion. And many times your weakest link in your system is your expansion tank, as was the case here. And uh, this one succumbed to the effects. Now, while we're on expansion tanks, here's a great-looking uh, job in, uh, submitted on Calefi Excellence, uh, ground source heat pumps. Uh, the designer on this, if you're listening, excellent work, by the way. Uh, but that's a good couple of expansion tanks. Um, got two because the system has a, a heat exchanger. But this designer could have elected to take in that expansion tank and turn it upside down and connected uh, it into the pipe. The system doesn't care. The expansion tank doesn't care. It performed the same. All right, the, the diaphragm would perform the same. But when you turn an expansion tank upside down, you have air bubbles that collect and start forming. They like to go what? Up to the top of the pipe because they're buoyant, right? If you have an upside down expansion tank, now you have a chamber by which that air can start begin collecting in there. And since you're now exposed to steel, you got air, steel, water, corrosion. So some experienced guys never put their expansion tanks upside down just for that reason, unless the expansion tank has a special design, like at least one manufacturer offers to uh, protect that part with a plastic uh, uh, covering. Okay, ferrous components while we're at it. Um, you might otherwise think this doesn't have any ferrous components because it's got aquatherm and perhaps a uh, stainless steel heat exchanger. I'm not sure if that's the case, brass components. But here we got steel expansion tank and maybe even a buffer tank over here. This is a glycol system, by the way, and again, a reminder that Bob will be on next month talking about glycol. So if you have glycol systems often in your market and you want to hear about that side of the business and how to um, handle glycol, um, tune in next month. So, so we got, what are the solutions we as designers now have at our fingertips for addressing to make sure we have no problems with iron oxide? Well, I'm going to borrow an advertisement from our division in France, Arlebou Francais. 
Uh, you don't have to read French to understand what this says, right? For, for the abolition of particles that are in solution, evolutionary. <laughs> Voila. Uh, this is our importer in French, Thermidor, and probably was running some type of promotion. So it's a nice opportunity to talk about our international business. So how do these magnetic dirt separators work? Here's an example. This is a small magnetic separator from a video we did uh, maybe a year ago. Uh, a strong magnet is in this collar that normally is around the separator here. And as the fluid that's laden with magnets circulates through this dirt separator that has a magnetic collar, the collar with magnets attracts the iron oxide, and when it comes time to get rid of it, the contractor opens up the valve, bleeds it, blows it down, in this case, into a cup, and we just wanted to show in this demonstration, what happens and how strong these magnets are, these neodymium rare earth magnets that we're using in our separators, puts it up to the side of the cup and the magnetite jumps to it pretty quickly. So it's a very strong and effective way of ridding a system or preventing magnetite from causing problems to begin with. So not to be outdone by our French counterparts on advertising, I put together in association with uh, um, uh, other assistants an ad that we did for our market in Quebec. So our folks on the phone here today from Quebec, there you go. And this is now our commercial magnetic separator. I'm going to go into the inside of this here in just a few minutes. But um, for the guys not used to, the 60% that haven't used the magnetic separator, uh, we've been selling it now uh, very successfully in North America, five, six, I don't know, it might be seven years now. Just some photographs of some guys that have used these magnetic separators. Um, Here's one from uh, Manitoba. Uh, this is a brass one, but you see a magnetic separator. All right, very nice job. Actually, it has an air separator over here. There's nothing wrong with having an air separator and a magnetic separator in the same line here. In fact, we make a combination combo device that does the two functions in one. Um, I think we come back to this photograph as one of the collective excellence uh, submittals at the end of this presentation. And so I'm going to accelerate here because I see I'm a little bit behind time. You can see. I just wanted to show some examples of uh, dirt uh, separators with magnets of Kalepis. By the way, you may have noticed an air vent screwed into the top. You can do that and make a provision for it, even though this is a dirt separator. Um, you do get rid of some air here, not as effectively as a dedicated air separator, but for a very small cost, put an air vent in the top of there. You can do the same thing in our large commercial magnetic separators as well, by the way, even though, in this case, you can see that the designer has a separate air separator in the system, system as well. In our mind, you can't have too much air separation in a system. Here's another magnetic separator as well. Nice job, by the way. And up in Alaska, two separators, two for <laughs> double the pleasure. Uh, this job, if you haven't seen it, it was a retrofit. I think it was a church, radiant heat with uh, tubing that had oxygen, no oxygen barrier, also had steel radiators, okay? A recipe for oxidation is going to take place. Iron oxide will form, even with very good air separation, maybe minimized. So the contractor here and designer elected to, okay, we'll just double up on our magnetic separation capability to keep the heat exchanger, the condensing boilers on this job, as well as the pumps uh, to be free of any issues, okay? All right, let's go to commercial now. So we've talked a lot about this guy here. We want to talk about this guy, right? So what did we do when we designed, how did we design this to give you some inside look as to what Kalefi does to developing product? Magnetic fields penetrate brass, or plastic for that matter, but not steel. So we couldn't really take a very strong magnetic collar and do like we did with our residential products and put it here because we would have a dilution of the field inside of the working area of that separator. Instead, we decided to go up with a rod of magnets into the heart of the dirt separator. And I'll show you that detail in a second. And again, to peek under our tent a little bit in our early development, just to prove the concept, we took a, uh, a system known to have magnetite in it and uh, took it offline, put in a couple of parallel separators, one a standard, just standard dirt separator over here in red, and then our prototype, we removed the uh, drain valve and up through the middle, put in a uh, rod of um, strong magnets. 
ran the uh, system for a couple of months, isolated, this, uh, isolated these guys, and then purged and took a look at what was inside. Very interesting. So we purged them. Here we're purging what was it, the contents inside of what was collected in the separator. We did this for both separators, purged it into a yellow bucket. Our findings, the separator that was just the standard separator without it, a magnet, we have as follows. You can look down there, and on the bottom of the vat, you can see chunks. It is a dirt separator, by the way. It better have some dirt in there, right? Some chunks, all right? But we have very clear liquid, all right? Microscopic small particle magnetite, not much got picked up. By contrast, our prototype, you can see the tarry water, all right? And to give you an idea of how much magnetite we picked up, we took the magnet out, dipped it down in here as you would a vanilla ice cream into a vat of chocolate, and pulled it out. And what did we see? We saw this. The magnetite jumped to our magnet, all right, and caked on. Now, it has kind of this knurled, rounded look here, only because we found that it's best if we kind of alter, alternate magnetic disc with spacers, magnetic disc, spacer, magnetic disc, spacer, to be most effective. And we see that same trend in some other prototype testing we did. This was actually done up here in Milwaukee. It's a design we ultimately didn't go with, but a horizontal version. But you can see the magnetite. This was a clear separator, um, so we can see what was going on, on the inside. But you can see, no chuckles, by the way. Uh, we can see the magnetite um, start to form here, all right, in the same kind of uh, bumping, reflecting the permanent magnets that we have in our stack. So we took, perfected the design, and here's a look at it, showing the Gauss or magnetic fields. And uh, our artist, Katie, uh, did this. But as debris comes in, even ferrous debris enters the magnetic field, gets sucked into the magnet before having a chance to float and get back out to the system somewhere. And adding the mesh back in to complete the assembly, you can see what's going on here. Debris comes in, it's captured, and uh, only to have the, well, what happens is, um, if you haven't seen this before, flow comes in. It dramatically slows down. It hits the impingement element to be deflected downward. Anything that has got a ferrous content to it gets sucked in by the magnet. And when it comes time to blow down, you open up the valve. Well, first you pull the magnet out slowly, blow down the valve, and we'll see an example of that. Here's a close-up of it. Now, if the dirt separator is located near the floor and you tried to pull a straight magnet out, it would, it would come in conflict with the floor. You wouldn't be able to get it out. So we articulated our magnet so it's in sections, and here it's kind of cracked. Now it stays together just by the strong force of the north side of this magnet and the south side of this magnet. Uh, it's unbelievable, the force, and you'll see that in the next slide here. If you put your finger in there and let that thing snap back on its own, you would not be a happy camper. These are some very strong magnets, and so caution is applied, it call, is called for. So, whoops, I jumped ahead of myself. So if you take Here's two magnets, and to demonstrate that, we just took two magnets and put it up against a 10-pound weight. I just showed you what was going to happen and see if we could pick it up off the floor. And here's Cody doing that, and especially for you bodybuilders out there, you can get appreciation for truly how strong these rare earth magnets that are used in our magnetic separators, as well as what the pump manufacturers do in the smart pumps. It's the same type of magnet. So now, in addition to our standard dirt separators that have been popular for some time. Thank you, Mr. Mueller from Colorado for sending this photograph in, by the way, in Kalepi Excellence. We now have the added uh, version of a magnet enhanced dirt separator. This is from our system actually here in uh, Milwaukee. We put this on only two and a half weeks ago and because uh, we've had some problems with magnetite from time and time, different types of problem, problems. Honestly, you think we're a hydronic manufacturer, we wouldn't what we do, and some of those problems affected um, uh, different types of pumps that we had over the years. So we um, ran the system for 18 days, and then uh, Cody shows before we blew off what was inside to see what was going on, started to bring the magnet out, slowly brought the magnet out. The brass lead that it, it rests in is still in the system, by the way, so that magnets is always, these magnets are always dry, by the way. 
pulled it out, blew it down, comes out pretty quickly, by the way. And again, you don't have to take the system offline. And here's what we found. Magnetite laden water. We took the sleeve out of the dirt separator, put the magnet back in, and dipped it into the bucket to see what would happen. And as we would expect, here's the tariness boiler ink, as it's sometimes referred to, uh, attracted to our magnet. Okay, it kind of gives you a feel for the attraction. Now, real quickly, yesterday we said, what will happen if you had a lot of magnetite? So we just, Kevin and Cody put it in a beaker, uh, the magnet. This is dry oxide, by the way. Pulled it out, and you can see, I mean, this is very heavy stuff and uh, the attraction. If we had a bigger beaker and more time, we probably should do it again with a wider beaker to see just really how much capacity these magnets have in collecting iron oxide. Okay, so a good dirt separator is vital. I'm going to jump pretty quickly here. I'm going to pick it up. Our air separators are very, very uh, good at ridding themselves of air. A lot of attention is given to our, our needle valve. You wouldn't believe the engineering that goes into that, our stainless steel stem, our pin float to make sure any scum or anything doesn't have any effect on our, on our uh, air vents. We get out to the field quite a bit. Um, here's one in Milwaukee. That's yours truly. Uh, this is our friends at Hot Water Products. There's Howard. There's Jack. Jack Daniels, by the way. Yep, Jack Daniels. I play softball with a guy named Johnny Walker, and I always thought it would be fun to have Jack and Johnny on the same team. We can find a Jim Beam and a Jose Carrero with to complete our infield. We'd be in good shape. So we uh, we do a lot of air separators. Here's our air and dirt combo. Um, now with magnet, air and dirt combos are a very popular um, item for the designers out there. Why? Versus an air and a dirt separately is because there's a lot of value packed into just one component. The air elimination capability and the dirt elimination capability is the same as an air and a separate air and dirt uh, separator. So I'm just showing you some photographs taken around North America. Here's a job out in California with a chiller having an air and dirt separator, a boiler before that building got buttoned up. Uh, here's another one out in Colorado. All right, happens to have a separate air separator on there. Not because they wanted more air separation, it's because there's a heat exchanger in between the two. This is a heat pump system. Thank you, um, Britannia. That might be Tim. Tim, if that's you, hi. You might be on this uh, webinar. And so now we got the air and dirt combos with magnetic separation available to the designer. Okay. Now um, I've talked about. I want to talk about placement. Here's just one example. And if you want to look at where to put air and dirt separators, check out Hydronics number 12. Hydronics number 12. Lots of examples of placing air and dirt separators uh, with a whole host of uh, designs. So we have a chilled water system here. We have a chiller. We have a distribution system here. And uh, so the air elimination performance of an air and dirt separator, the air elimination is always best where the where the water temperature is highest which in every chilled water system is going into the chiller, and also where the pressure is lowest. And now we have a big primary circuit pump over here, so we know over here our pressure is probably lowest. Uh, we're missing an expansion tank, probably should be right about here. In any event, good selection for an air and dirt separator, because not only are we maximizing the air and dirt elimination uh, capabilities of this device, we're also protecting the close passage heat exchangers on that boiler, and perhaps an ECM pump over here to boot, or even the standard split ca uh, case pump with mechanical seals, as we talked about in earlier slides. All right. So magnetic separation and hydronic systems. I'm going to pause and say something right now that I forgot to say. If questions are coming to mind, type them in. I'm probably not going to have time to get to them, but we're going to answer all those questions, and then we'll publish for all the people listening in here today our answers to those questions so everyone can benefit. So no worries, we'll get to it if we don't have time to today. Chemicals, real briefly, maybe five minutes. Magnetic separate, uh, pH levels. The pH of a system takes increased importance when there's oxygen in the system. That might be if there's a lot of oxygen ingress or if there isn't a very good air separator, okay? If you keep pH in check, perhaps in a, most systems of slightly alkaline level, neutral 7, perhaps 8 to 10. I've seen everything spec from 8.2 to 10, 8.5 to 9.8, pretty much in that range, 8, 
nine, ten, slightly alkaline, you will decrease what oxygen can do to your system in terms of corrosion. You can eliminate it, but you can minimize it, okay? Be mindful of other system components such as aluminum and stainless steel. The, the chiller manufacturers and the boiler guys will specify the level appropriate for them. Now, we're not chemical experts over here, and I'm going to regurgitate some things just from researching the topic of chemical additives. We are a fan of chemical additives. We're a fan of demineralized water, too, by the way, uh, but we're also a, a fan of chemical additives. Oxygen, oxygen scavengers, oxygen binders, kind of the same thing, sodium sulfide as an example, very common. They do get consumed if you have an ongoing source of oxygen, so you need to check, you know. And they'll, like a lot of chemicals, they can come out of solution and create their own solids or dirt issue to contend with. Other, um, I'm not even going to say that word, but other chemicals <laughs> produce a protective film on the a metal uh, and decreasing the effects of oxidant, oxidation. You have to be careful about mixing and circulating when using this type of chemical. Chromates, borates, nitrates, you can read up on this. Back to chromates, you got to be careful in high concentration levels not to have any degradation effect on EPT, EPT type uh, elastomers, O-rings, lip seals, and the like. Um, check, in, uh, check your water, check your fluid uh, from time to time to make sure everything is okay, and always check with your local rep or manufacturer on anything related to chemicals. There's a lot of good sites out there, too. Uh, Radio Professionals Alliance uh, is uh, a good one that I use uh, in some of that matter. Okay, i got about uh, 15 minutes left. I'm going to take 10 of those, and then we're going to have um, voting for the Calefi Excellence and maybe a time for some questions if we get to that. Now, you might be thinking, if you haven't been familiar with something called a dirt separator, uh, as a designer, you might commonly use Y strainers, but not too familiar with these dirt separators we talked about, whether they have a magnet or not. And I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on this issue because it looks like if 60% of you have not used a magnetic dirt separator, maybe a big chunk of you haven't used the dirt separator. So Y strainers are very common, very good product. Here's the Kalefi job that had uh, Y strainers on them to protect uh, perhaps those uh, unstrung pumps or other equipment. Here's some Y strainers to protect the heat exchangers in these lock and bar boilers. Nice job from HVAC. Uh, technical services, by the way. And so Y strainers, one of the things about Y strainers, the way they work, water comes into a basket and they start to filter from the inside out. And uh, taking a look at a bigger basket, this is a four inch unit that we pulled out the strainer. And uh, the way they work is debris collects uh, inside the mesh. The smaller debris is allowed to continue passing. <laughs> I didn't notice, but these look like rocks, very pretty rocks. I'm not sure if you would ever see rocks like this in a hydronic system, but it kind of gets the point across. Um, but anyway, uh, smaller particles, unlike a, a dirt separator, are free to pass. Now, ultimately, the smaller particles will start separating out just before the strainer actually clogs up and creates pr its own problems in the system, the circuit that that strainer is trying to protect, you might starve that system of flow, causing perhaps a boiler goes out on low flow uh, or low pressure cutout, and then someone has to come service that product. You hope for that. You hope a, a failure doesn't happen on one of the components. By comparison, these dirt separators, I'm going to show a brass one by comparison, as I indicated, as debris comes in, the debris gets taken to the bottom of the separator and allowing the working section to always remain free of any type of uh, debris. What does that mean to us as um, designers and engineers is that we have a lot less pressure drop. Here's three curves. Here's a standard Y strainer. And we looked at a one inch as an, as an example. A very new Y strainer, clean basket, hasn't been used yet. Once it gets, and this is the pressure drop as a function of flow. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead to that. That same Y strainer, once it gets clogged, 70% clogged, look what happens to the pressure drop. It really starts to create, cause those um, perhaps variable speed pumps that have to work a little harder or could create the problems I mentioned earlier. A dirt separator, by comparison, significantly less pressure drop. And as it does its job getting rid of debris, it doesn't change the pressure drop as it, as it uh, works. Now I'll jump ahead. 
dirt separators, and this is an eyeful. It's a good example of maybe why you want to come back if you want to get into details here. But this is a, a dirt separator shown in green here. This is basically um, the efficiency as a function of particle size, but the upshot is here, why strainers and specialty strainers, they can only go so far in terms of ridding a system of debris. These type of separators can take debris down to five microns out of a system pretty easily. And this was a chart that we did before we did magnetic separators added to our, our dirt separators. And as you remember in my earlier slide, the diameter of magnetite can get pretty small. And we now have a way of taking out even that small magnetite and hematite that floats around in the system. Okay, I have ended my material here. I'm sorry, went through a lot of things quickly, but I wanted to allow some time to maybe get a question or two. But we're going to first let you know what's ahead. Next month, Bob comes back, talks about glycol. In July, Mr. John Siegenthaler is our guest presenter talking about buffering, thermal buffering in hydronic systems. In fact, that's the topic of our next hydronics design journal, all right, coming out in July. And so the timing is kind of nice, one complementing the other. In August, we have another guest speaker, an engineer from Chicago area, from Engineering Works, and he's going to talk about smart objects, BIM. Uh, all of our products uh, have Revit files available to you designers, as well as all the other documents uh, you need from a manufacturer like us. And Jim's going to talk about using BIM in general in a hydronic system. And in, in, in doing so, he'll show you Clefi BIM files. He'll show them being imported, connectivity, pipe connectivity. And maybe for the younger designers out there, it might be of particular interest, too, uh, if you're kind of new to um, solid um, uh, smart uh, building information modeling objects. Combustion. Jody Samuel, our manager of engineering training, who is uh, on the East Coast this week, is going to talk about combustion, theory and concepts for hydronic systems. It's an important topic. You'll get into how condensing boilers work, uh, traditional large mass boilers, and a follow-up webinar will be on condensing boiler efficiency, hydronic systems for condensing boilers. So back to back, and then we wrap up the year. Bob does. Uh, proper, high, uh, proper component selection for boilers and application fundamentals, number one and number two. He's going to take schematics of hydronic systems and talk about why things are where they are and about those products, just to have you visualize this. It's a very potent concept in how to educate why do you select this type of balancing valve, why do you put it where you do, why do you put this air separate over here and not over there, and if you do put it over there, what are some of the problems you might find? And he'll walk through all the key components that you typically will find in a um, hydronic heating system. Okay? So, hydronics number 17 is coming out soon, and um, these are all free for all the new people on board here today, and uh, if you haven't signed up, uh, do so. It's easy. Just get onto our website, register, and uh, a hard copy comes to your desk. Okay, before we do this, I failed to launch another poll that you'll be very interested in. So, I'm going to see if I can do it, and then we're going to get into the voting. All right. In your experience, what equipment has iron oxide caused problems with, all right? In your experience, from what, you, what you've heard or seen as designers or witness as installers, wholesalers, what kind of, and you can do multiple choices here if there's more than one. This is more information now for us to know, okay? And so we're gonna let this kinda, I still, a lot of people voting on here, not voting, uh, selecting here, and so we're starting to see what's taking place there. All right, starting to settle out. I'm going to close it because it's now uh, very few. And then we're going to share. 
There you go. All right. Very few people don't know. Seems like if you have a problem, you pretty much know where it's going to take place. Circulator is 70%. Boilers, more or less the same. Chillers and heat pumps, 28%. Other equipment, 30%. If anyone wants to expound, expound to us about your experiences on anything, photographs, like anything, we appreciate your photos. We like to give credit for them when we use in our training slides. But this is very interesting for us to see and probably for you as well. So I'm going to close that. Timing. When are these um, products available from Kalefi? The commercial dirt separators are available now. They are available as ASME certified separators and uh, from 2 inch, currently from 2 inch to 6 inch. They're also very shortly going to be available in non-ASME in case you, your job does not require that. So we're pretty much locked and loaded on that. We've sold some already, and we're waiting for some photographs from the first uh, purchase orders, but those are now available. The other question on the, on the availability of the combination, the air and dirt separator combined with the magnet, when are those available? Those are available in Q3. We'll communicate more details out, and those as well be, will be from 2 inch to 6 inch. Okay. Okay, what is your opinion in using deionized water and sacrificial anodes in a closed loop system? And maybe I'll do one more after this. Uh, we're big fans on deionized water, or also referred to as demineralized water. And um, in fact, I think as we saw in Europe, we're going to see North America go more and more to this. Why? Number one is that it doesn't have, it, it eliminates any minerals that could come out of, otherwise come out of solution, meaning calcium and magnesium and wreak havoc on your high temperature surfaces, number one. Number two is it, 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 it eliminates, it minimizes the electrical conductivity characteristics of the fluid inside the water, meaning you don't get that battery cell effect that causes galvanic attack, okay? Now, in doing so, you want to make sure your pH is right, and so there might be a need to go in and adjust the pH when you use demineralized water, but it dramatically reduces the need for adding chemicals in, and the cost associated with maintaining those chemicals, as you guys know, is an issue. So that's our opinion on that. Uh, a related question is, uh, how about sacrificial anodes in a closed loop system? We don't have personal experience on this, but we have seen in an, earlier, an earlier webinar done with us uh, with, by Jeff Persons has had success um, using sacrificial anodes, as you would a hot water heater, in becoming the uh, basically where galvanic attack will take place, whether you're using zinc or, or magnesium. Um, good question, by the way. Uh, we recently experienced a tremendous amount of reddish silt in a brand new system. What would be the most likely cause of this? Well, in a brand new system, hmm, brand new system, you're not going to have hem hematite form that quickly, uh, our opinion. Uh, something else is causing that red, and it's hard to guess what that could be. Not sure if you use a chemical that could be perhaps a propylene glycol or the like. Does glycol create the same problem in the system, or is it only water? Good question, and Bob's going to cover this in spades next month. Propylene glycol often will be um, supplied to the market with inhibitors, and those inhibitors will help protect some aspect of the system. Perhaps it's oxygen scavengers. Perhaps it's a, um, a stabilizer. Um, but Glycol with inhibitors will help with the um, problem that we talked about relative to oxygen. Won't get rid of it. And as we heard from Jim Paling, who's uh, been around the industry for some time now and a lot of experience, 
adding a magnetic separator. By the way, adding a magnetic separator to a, just a separator, our cost is not that much more than just a standard separator. Incrementally, I'm going to 20%, you know, something like that, 15, 20%, maybe a little bit higher than that, a little bit lower, somewhere in that range. So it's really good insurance. All right, I am way over here now. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Congratulations to the winner of Kalefi Excellence. Any comments, suggestions, or anything else, be in touch. Meantime, we'll be talking to you soon on a future Coffee with Kalefi.